Hello friends, I'm about to watch the premiere of the new Brady Armstrong movie, but before I do, I'm going to discuss another Nancy Drew book versus game with you. This is a video series I've been doing for a little while now in which I tell you the difference between the Nancy Drew books and the video games, but also the differences. Make sure to subscribe if you want to see more book versus game videos, and please like and comment if you enjoy as well. Today I'm looking at The Final Scene, the fifth game in the Nancy Drew series, and the 38th book in the Nancy Drew Files series. Yes, we're back to my favorite the Nancy Drew Files, which dares to take Nancy Drew to a PG-13 rating. Be aware I'll be giving spoilers for both The Final Scene book and game in this video. The theater on the cover doesn't exactly resemble the ultra-historic theater in the game. It's more like a 1980s mall movie theater. Yep, that's what Nicholas Falcone is fighting so hard to preserve. What I'm most impressed by is the fact that Nancy on the cover looks almost exactly like the actress who plays her in the CW TV show. And this book came out before she was even born. When a handsome teen idol comes to Nancy's hometown, crime grabs the spotlight. I'm imagining the personification of crime yanking Brady Armstrong off the stage with a comedy cane like in an old-timey vaudeville show. Let's peruse the synopsis. Film star Brady Armstrong is in River Heights for the premiere of his newest movie at the Grand Old Century Cinema. When Nancy's friend Bess decides to go backstage to see her heartthrob, she stumbles into a kidnapping meant for the movie actor. But the kidnapper doesn't want ransom money. He demands that the planned demolition of the Century Cinema Theater be halted, or Bess will be destroyed with it. Unable to prevent the wreckers from tearing down the building, Nancy races against time to discover where Bess is hidden, and unmask the mysterious figure who is dead set on stealing the show. Some obvious differences here, it's Bess, not Maya, who is kidnapped, and the theater is called the Century Cinema instead of the Royal Palladium. And the story takes place in River Heights instead of St. Louis. Without further ado, it's Finally, time to start this scene. Dear Bess, remember Maya Wynn from high school? I'm visiting her in St. Louis. We have tickets to tonight's premiere of the new Brady Armstrong movie, Vanishing Destiny. Chapter 1. Bess, George, and Nancy are waiting outside the Century Cinema before the premiere of the new Brady Armstrong movie, Night of the Venus Moon. Nancy watched Bess take in the photo of Brady, dressed as the Space Knight, Jonathan Ryder. He was wearing the white spacesuit and holding the glistening laser sword that he had become famous for. Wow, that sounds uh, weirdly familiar. <laughs> the girls apparently attended high school with Brady and Bess had a big crush on him. Bess really wants to get into the theater to see Brady, so obviously Nancy suggests they try a little breaking and entering. PG-13 Nancy does not mess around. Does that make this a crime of passion? George asked innocently. Thank you, George, for acknowledging that this is a crime. Bess says, I just want a chance to see him alone. I have to know if he remembers me after all this time. Which is the flimsy excuse for the setup of a story that I've ever heard. No wonder they wrote Maya into Bess's part for the game. Wanting to interview him for a university newspaper feels a lot more justified than this. I don't know what makes them think this is okay. This feels like the very definition of entitlement. Why are they more worthy to see Brady Armstrong up close and personal than any of the other fans waiting outside the theater? Because they went to high school with him? Yeah, along with all the other people in River Heights close in age to them. I highly doubt that Bess was even the only one with a crush on him. And think about how invasive this is. Bess wants to break into his private space and attempt to tempt him with a romantic, or even sexual, this book is PG-13, offer. You could get arrested for that, and if their genders were reversed and Bess was a man, she almost definitely would be. Bess says, Do you suppose he'll get mad at me for barging in on him like this? I don't think he'll get mad, Nancy said. 
Brady was always a nice guy. Brady Armstrong could be Mother Teresa, and I still think he'd get mad at three girls breaking into his dressing room to oogle at him and beg for attention. Although if he were Mother Teresa, I don't think Bess would want to break into his dressing room. They break the lock on the back door of the theater, and when they get to the dressing room, Nancy says to Bess, We'd offer to come in with you, but I'm sure you'd like to be... alone? Do they really think Bess is going to get lucky in there? Is that what they really think is going to happen? To be fair, Bess's look is stylish and searingly contemporary, with a whole can of mousse on her head, pink blush, and a teal blue sweater dress with silver sequin and gold bugle bead trim. How could Brady resist? Before long, Nancy and George hear a male voice calling out for help from the dressing room, which would be a perfectly reasonable reaction to finding a strange girl had broken into your dressing room. But no, apparently Brady was attacked by someone in a ski mask. There was someone else in there too, Brady added. A blonde girl. And she's still in there with that maniac. After all that, Bess doesn't even get the recognition she craved enough to make her commit multiple felonies. Brady doesn't even know who she is. When they return to the dressing room, neither Bess nor the mysterious strangler, as they call them, are there. Aren't you Nancy Drew? I remember you from school, Brady said. Oh, so he remembers Nancy. Glad Bess wasn't there to hear that. Three people are waiting outside the dressing room. Joseph Hughes, no explanation needed. Brady's manager, Simon Mueller. And Deirdre McCullough, not that Deirdre. A character that doesn't appear in the game. And Brady's co-star in Definitely Not Star Wars. Joseph provides an introduction for Nancy. This is Nancy Drew. You may have heard of Nancy. She's River Heights' best known detective. Does River Heights have any other detectives? Either way, Simon didn't seem impressed. <laughs> Where are you from? River Heights? Why? Yes, precisely. <laughs> River Heights. Joseph mentions that Bess used to work at the movie theater and that he was really fond of her. So Joseph has a personal connection to Bess. That's interesting. He also tells Nancy that the theater has a lot of secret passages, including one between the men's and women's dressing rooms. I may have to cut this short, Hal. Someone just climbed out of my wardrobe. Nancy and George meet Nicholas Falcone. Nicholas slammed his fist down on the desk. <laughs> okay, I'll stop action out the actions. That was awful. It figures that something like this would happen here in this theater, as if the place didn't have problems enough of its own without this. Excuse me, but it is my friend whose life is in danger, Nancy replied dryly, thinking that Falcone's concern for the building was just a little misplaced. So if you were wondering if Nancy is just as fiery and assertive in the book as she is in the game, the answer is yes. <laughs> But they won't mess with your friend. They just took her for effect. It's called making a statement. Oh, so this is just a pretend kidnapping. I never would have guessed. Maya's scream sounded so real. Just then, Joseph comes running up to join them. I just got a phone call from the kidnapper, he said. He told me, let me make sure I have this right. Yes, he said. If you let them tear down the royal palladium, I guarantee you'll never see her again. Oh, is that what he said, Joseph? The royal palladium? Nancy echoed. What's the royal palladium? Nicholas explains that the royal palladium was the name of the theater before it became a movie house. And yes, he uses that exact wording. Did people really say movie house in 1989? It feels so delightfully antiquated, like something someone would say in 1919, probably while wearing a boater hat. Nicholas is 23. Why does he talk like a grandfather reminiscing about the good old days? Joseph says, I just wish I'd been there when that scoundrel nabbed young Bess. Oh, do you, Joseph? You'll probably be amazed by what happens next. Half a dozen police officers rush into the lobby. That's right, the police are actually responsive in this book. 
Eh, seems fake. Okay, miss. I'll file this report. After 24 hours, if she hasn't turned up, we consider her a missing person and begin to investigate. How can she turn up? She's been kidnapped! Unlikely. With all the scuttlebutt around this demolition, this stinks of student prank. The police officer in charge is a man named Detective Ryan. Oh, I guess there are other detectives in River Heights, or at least one other. Flash forward to a few hours later when the group is taking a quick break from searching for Bess. One of the police officers, who's described as being tall and handsome for some reason, I don't know why that's relevant, offers Nancy and George a bag of hamburgers and french fries. No thank you, Nancy said. Just looking at food made her think of Bess, who was constantly dieting to lose the same five pounds. Boy, wish Bess was here so she could feel insecure about her weight. What I miss most about my friend is her unhealthy obsession with diet culture. We also learn that the theater is scheduled to be demolished in a month, which is a lot less stressful time frame. Nancy can really take her time looking for Bess. There's no need to rush. Cut to two pages later. Nancy and George are searching the woman's dressing room when Nicholas Falcone strolls in. The person in charge of tearing down the theater is a man named Bart Anderson, a name so similar to Brady Armstrong it makes you wonder if an editor ever laid eyes on this book. Especially when you realize Deirdre's name is spelled differently each time she's mentioned. Anyway, Nicholas and good old Bart just had a quote-unquote chat, and Bart got so steamed that he's pushed up the demolition to three days from now, so thanks for that, Nicholas. This just feels so implausible unless Bart plans to tear down the theater with his own bare hands. I've never been responsible for the demolition of a building myself, but I imagine that it takes a lot of coordination and red tape and that a lot of people are involved in the process. You can't just decide to move it up 28 days earlier than you originally planned. What about the demolition crew? I'm sure they're not just sitting around twiddling their thumbs until this specific project rolls around. No, they've probably got other jobs to do that were scheduled many months ago and can't accommodate a guy who decides to change a demolition date based on a whim. Also, Bart really lets a squabble with a lone protester influence his decision when there's a very real possibility that there's a young girl trapped in this building. Not a good look. When Nancy brings this up to him, he says, The police don't think so, and that's enough for me. Absolutely ruthless. Nancy goes home and talks to Hannah and her father about the situation. It's too bad you can't tell Bess's parents. I know, Nancy answered. Of all the times for them to be touring Africa. Oh, well, that's terribly inconvenient. But I guess no different than Maya's parents in the game, who are similarly unreachable on a trip to Vietnam. Then the doorbell rings. It's a delivery. A funeral wreath accompanied by a note. I don't want to hurt the girl. But if the royal palladium dies, she will be killed too. It's a note threatening Bess's life, but they don't even give her the dignity of referring to her by her name. She's just the girl. You can really tell she's just a tool in the culprit's plan, and that their claim that they don't want to hurt her is meaningless. It's kind of tragic that Bess doesn't get the recognition and therefore validation that she seeks from Brady, and then isn't even awarded that recognition by the culprit in a note advertising her own impending demise. When Nancy arrives at the theater the next morning, she sees Joseph polishing a brass handrail. He catches her attention. I almost forgot to give you this. Last night when I was vacuuming in the leading lady's dressing room, I found something on the floor. I don't know if it belongs to Bess or not. Oh, don't you, Joseph? The item he's referring to is one of Bess's rhinestone earrings. I'm sure that went really well with her teal blue sweater dress with silver sequin and gold bugle bead trim. I just love how specific that description is. The writer really wanted the reader to imagine Bess in that exact outfit. Nancy tells Joseph that he's a good friend. She brings the funeral wreath and Bess's earring to River Heights' second best detective and is like, surely this is all the evidence you need to halt the demolition, but no, of course it isn't. Detective Ryan says, the note doesn't state that she's here. 
Only if that the theater dies, she will too. Golly. Nancy goes to investigate the stage area and is hit by a falling lamp. A deep male voice came over the PA system. It was distorted with a heavy reverberation. That was only a warning, Ms. Drew, the voice said. Just a dress rehearsal, you could say. If you want to see Bess Marvin again, you'd better not search for her any longer. If you persist, what happened just now is an indication of what you and your friend can expect. Oh, so the culprit does know Bess's name. George, with Joseph's help, discovers evidence of Bess in a room underneath the stage. There's her purse and one of her shoes and a makeshift bed that has clearly been slept in. At least the kidnapper has been feeding her, Joseph said, pointing to a half-eating pizza that lay in a box on the floor. George laughed. Something's wrong with Bess. If Bess was her normal self, she never would have left half that pizza uneaten. That's a little flippant, considering the circumstances, and is really the only thing Nancy or George remember about Bess, her unhealthy relationship with food? Maya never had to deal with this <laughs> Later, Nancy and George follow a shadowy figure through the theater, who lures George onto the catwalk and causes it to collapse beneath her. Attempted murder. Joseph and Nicholas Falcone appear on the scene suspiciously quickly, and Nicholas heroically saves George. In my opinion, George should have saved herself. Her athletic ability is frequently pointed out in the books, so it makes sense within the, frankly, quite narrow definition of her character. And the whole conceit of the Nancy Drew series, ever since the first book was released in 1930, 44 years before women were able to obtain a credit card in their own name, and only two years after they gained the right to vote, is about a young girl being both capable and independent, and being more than able to use her own intuition to successfully solve and survive dangerous mysteries. She really should have saved herself. But that doesn't happen, and Nicholas saves George, and she gazes up at him with adoration. That's literally the word they chose. Oh, and Brenda Carlton, the reporter you might know best from her role in Alibi and Ashes, shows up in this book and prompts the best out-of-context quote from Nancy. You'd be surprised what you can find out while lurking behind a palm tree, Nancy said. <laughs> Wise words, Nancy. Wise words. Brenda informs Nancy that Simon Mueller was responsible for crafting three faux kidnapping stunts for clients before Brady. Brenda then fades out of the narrative like Homer Simpson disappearing into that bush, her obligatory delivery of exposition complete. Nancy goes to check out the theater stage again as if she hadn't learned her lesson the first two times. As almost anyone could have predicted, Nancy finds her life in danger yet again when she gets bonked on the head by a giant movie scene, in a scene that's described in a way that's genuinely terrifying. A flash of silver above Nancy made her flick her eyes up, just in time to see a heavy object come falling from the ceiling. A movie screen hit her then, striking her on the head. Nancy fell to the floor. As she lay there, she felt a suffocating darkness close in. She tried to move, but her legs were pinned under the screen. She tried to scream, but she couldn't make a sound come out of her throat. It was a nightmare. Then the darkness became a black void that swallowed her, and she slipped into unconsciousness. I can't believe they kept that in, PG-13 rating or not. Oh right, the editor at Simon & Schuster glanced at the first two pages and decided that it was probably good. They obviously never read far enough to see that the immoral, exploitative agent is named Simon. Nancy woke up to the sounds of breakfast carts being wheeled down the hall. A loud voice paged, Dr. Evans, Dr. Evans, please come to ICU. Blinking her eyes against the morning sun that streamed through a window beside her bed, she murmured, Where am I? What happened? And in an instant, Carson Drew was at her side, holding her hand. Nancy, it's me, Dad. Wake up. You've been in a coma for seven years. No, it's only been one night, but still, that's one night closer to Bess's demise. Nancy sustained a head injury, probably a concussion, because she describes her vision as 
swimming and can't remember getting bonked on the head by a movie screen. She says, It feels like there's a team of hockey players going at it inside my skull. At least it hasn't affected her ability to form similes. In fact, I think it might have enhanced it. Along with her head injury, Nancy also has a sprained arm. We find out that George has fallen in love with Nicholas and disapproves of Nancy still considering him a suspect. I have to suspect everyone, Nancy said carefully. And yes, he's still one of my prime suspects. The kidnapper is a man who's well acquainted with the theater. Nicholas knows the place, and he has a strong motive for the kidnapping family, loyalty, and love of the place. In the book, Nicholas's grandfather and great-grandfather created the ornate plasterwork on the ceilings of the theater, not his grandmother. So, said a voice from the doorway, they all turned to see Nicholas standing there with a box of chocolates in his hand and a dark look of anger on his handsome face. Just because I'm loyal to my family and want to preserve that beautiful old building, that makes me a kidnapper? He asked pointedly. He walked across the room and tossed the candy onto the foot of the bed. I heard about your accident, Nancy, he said. I came to tell you that I hope you recover quickly. He walked back to the door where he stood with his hand on the knob. I'm sorry that you think of so little of me as a person, he said with bitter sarcasm, but I still hope you get well soon. He slammed the door behind him. He obviously didn't hear Nancy say, I suspect everyone. George says, his feelings are really hurt. Okay, George. Well, Nancy's head and arm were literally hurt. Like, someone tried to kill her. So please don't tell me Nicholas's feelings were hurt. Nancy, being Nancy, checks out of the hospital against the doctor's orders. She says to George, Maybe I should be hit on the head more often. I just thought of something we should have done long ago. We need to go to City Hall to see if we can locate the blueprints of the theater. There might be a hidden room we haven't searched. To be fair, she does do that a lot sooner in the game. Nancy and George arrive at River Heights to find that the blueprints aren't there, that they were checked out by someone. Next, the two girls drive to Nicholas's apartment. The apartment is in utter disarray, and Nicholas himself is nowhere to be seen. Then Joseph shows up and starts muttering to himself. This wasn't supposed to happen. Nobody was supposed to get hurt. He then races away, jumping through an open window onto a fire escape. Nancy and George saw Joseph scurrying down the escape, nimbly jumping from one level to the next. They both watched the old man as he hit the ground running and disappeared down the nearest alley. They turned to each other, both of them thinking the same thing. Nancy was the first to say it. He sure is spry for such an old fellow. <laughs> Nancy and George decide that they need to find Bart Anderson and tell him about Joseph to convince him to stop the demolition. They find Bart in a trailer on a building site. He's got Nicholas Falcone tied to a chair and is threatening to kill him. I know you've got that girl, he roared. And if you don't tell me where she is right now, I swear I'm going to kill you. Are Nancy and George going to think of a cunning plan to lure Bart away so that they can save Nicholas? Oh, no, they're just going to march right in there without a second thought. I don't think you can solve one kidnapping by committing another, Nancy said. George frees Nicholas and Nancy's like, you know, I'm beginning to think Joseph might be a little suspicious. But Joseph couldn't have kidnapped Bess, George said. He was making the introduction for the movie over the PA at the time. Nancy said he could easily have made the tape ahead of time and rigged the PA system to play at the right moment. They leave the trailer and guess what? Bart's moved the demolition time up again. That building's coming down in 15 minutes. I don't want any of this foolishness to interfere with my project. Oh my god, sir. Then Nancy's like, my friend is going to die if you tear down that building. And Bart's like, oh, I, I didn't realize. Like, that hasn't been a constant fear this whole book. They race to the theater just in time to see a wrecking ball crash into the side of the theater and completely completely demolish a whole wall. Gee, I sure hope Bess wasn't being kept on that side of the theater. Nancy, Nicholas, and George ran through the front door of the theater. 
Their only thought was of their friend and her safety. Not to be pedantic, but Nicholas doesn't even know Bess. He's literally never met her. Nancy goes into the auditorium, the heart of the theater, and finds Joseph sitting there. Did they even do a check of the building to make sure no one was in there before the demolition started? Because Joseph is literally sitting in the most prominent place in the building. Actually, they probably didn't because Bart Anderson thought it was a good idea to give them only 15 minutes to get ready for the demolition. Bart is to blame for probably 90% of the problems in this book. And Bess is responsible for the other 10%. Oh, and apparently at this point they've just stopped the demolition, so there's really no sense of urgency in these last few chapters. Nancy confronts Joseph and he runs away, making her chase him through secret passageways and upstairs. George and Nicholas join in on the chase too, so there's just three of them running down this scared old man, yelling things like, there he is, and get him. They corner Joseph in the projection room, and he pleads that he never meant to hurt Bess, and he tried to help Nancy by making it obvious that Bess was still in the theater. But why did you try to scare Nancy off at the same time? George asked, confused. You mean the flowers, the light, and the movie screen? Joseph asked. I never meant to hurt you, Nancy. I just thought that if things kept happening at the theater, you'd know not to stop looking there. Oh, I never meant to hurt you when I dropped a light and a massive movie screen on your head, Nancy. And yes, Joseph is responsible for the funeral wreath in the book. It makes a lot more sense for Simone to order the wreath in the game, given her hunger for publicity. The wreath just feels too morbid and indulgent for it to make sense for Joseph's character. The trio get Joseph to show them where Bess is, which turns out to be in the building's ice depository. Nancy knelt beside the hole and shined her flashlight into the darkness. That was when she saw the most welcome sight of her life. A patch of teal blue in the sparkle of sequins! Not the teal blue sweater dress with the silver sequin and gold bugle bead trim! Nicholas, for some reason, insists on getting Bess out, even though, like I said, he's literally never met Bess in his life. He just likes to insert himself into the narrative, I guess. Make himself the hero. It should be Nancy or George getting her out. Especially because she's been through such a traumatizing experience. I think it would help to see a familiar face. But anyway, Bess is saved! Cut to George, Nancy, and Carson Drew gathered around Bess's hospital bed. We learn that the demolition of the theater has been permanently cancelled, and the city have decided to make it a historical landmark, without any involvement from Brady. Speaking of Brady, he and Deirdre, remember her, Brady's co-star, come to visit Bess in the hospital. Do you remember me? Bess asked breathlessly. Of course I do. His green eyes twinkled and he smiled his easy, heart-stopping smile. And you're just as pretty as I remember you. Even prettier. You can just tell Brady's using every ounce of his acting ability in this scene. Brady gives Bess a bouquet of red roses, invites her out for dinner, and kisses her on the cheek. How much do we want to bet that this is a publicity scheme cooked up by Simon Mueller? Bess says, Wow! A kiss from Brady Armstrong! I almost feel like it was worth getting kidnapped! Oh my god. Dear Bess, I still can hardly believe that Joseph, sweet old Joseph, was Maya's kidnapper. There are a lot of things in this book that were just weirdly overcomplicated when they didn't need to be, like Bessie's reason for being in Brady's dressing room, and Bart Anderson continuously changing the date of the demolition to add drama, I guess, but in a way that felt extremely artificial. Her interactive did a great job of examining the events of the book and adding a healthy dose of logic where it was needed. In terms of other differences, a lot of the conversations which occur in person in the book happen as phone calls in the game, as the game confines itself to one location, which makes perfect sense for a video game, but not as much for a book where the plot has to move at a breakneck speed, with minimum five events happening per page and a dramatic cliffhanger every five pages. There are a few extra characters in the book which feel extraneous. Like Deirdre. What the fuck does Deirdre add to the plot? You might have noticed I barely mentioned her during this video and there's a reason for that. Another thing that confuses me about this book is that it takes place in River Heights, Nancy's hometown, and involves the kidnapping of one of her closest friends, and yet Nancy never reaches out to Ned for help. 
She doesn't even call to tell him what's going on or to seek comfort from him, despite emphasizing that he's the only guy she's ever loved at the start of this book. So you're telling me that Nancy is deeply in love with Ned and then not demonstrating that at all in the text and in fact never actually mentioning Ned again from the whole book. This is text to book tell and completely forget to show in any meaningful way. That really demonstrates how much Nancy cares for Ned that she can just completely forget about him for long stretches of time. At least you have the option to call Ned in the game, even though I never do. <laughs> But the options there. Wow, I guess this means that the way I play Nancy, avoiding Ned at all costs, is actually canon. Well, I better go. I want to get some popcorn before Vanishing Destiny starts.